So, before we get busy making the new things, we've got to get rid of the old thing, and that means getting rid of the old doors and drawers. Now, every drawer I've ever dealt with has been screwed into place with two screws, but this time I ran into something new. Screwed and stapled. Weird. But the staples were no problem to deal with, and it actually added a new source of fun to the project. Now once I had all the fronts removed, it was time to deal with the top. But first things first, I need to turn off the water supply and disconnect those lines as well as the drain to the sink. With everything safely disconnected, I can now work on removing the top. Most vanity tops are held in place with nothing more than caulk or silicone adhesive, and if you run a utility blade carefully along the caulk line, you can separate it from the wall. After doing this to all sides of the backsplash, I can engage my Hulk strength to pull the vanity up and break it free from the silicone seal. You can see it there separating from the wall, and with the assistance of my wife, we managed to lift it off with only minimal damage to the wall. I'll take that as a win, but what we found underneath was surprise number two, old wallpaper. Now, this is a video about vanity upgrades, not old wallpaper removal. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip the part where I suck at removing old wallpaper and get on to the part where I build stuff. To build the doors and drawer fronts, I'm gonna use what's called frame and panel construction. Now, basically that means that you have four sides with a panel floating in the middle. And for materials, I'm using pre-surfaced hard maple lumber. Pre-surface just means that the lumber yard has already flattened both sides and cut a straight edge along one side for me so that I don't need a joiner or a planer to mill my lumber. I could just take it straight to the table saw and start cutting. All of these parts will be two inches in width so I don't even have to move the fence, just grip it and rip it. After that, I use my crosscut sled to cut all my parts to length. I could have used a miter saw for this task as well, and that's a good alternative if you haven't made a crosscut sled for your table saw. And if you haven't made a crosscut sled yet, I have a whole video on making this one, and you can find it in the description below along with plans to build your own. Okay, now I need to cut grooves in all my parts to accept the center panel, and I'll be using a special set of router bits to do this. The first bit that I'm gonna use is gonna cut the grooves in all the sides. If you don't have a router table, you can also do this exact same thing using your table saw and a flat tooth grind blade, but I've got nine of these to make and it's just faster for me to do it with router bits. I'm gonna be cutting these grooves slightly off center, so I do need to make sure to mark which side is the face so that when I go to put these together, I don't screw up the glue up. Next, I need to cut the tongues on the ends of the top and bottom parts, and I'll be doing this with the other router bit in the set. To make this cut, I'm using a coping sled. This is the safest and most accurate way to make this cut on your router table. I made this one, and I do have a video on how I did it, and also plans available to build your own if you wanna check out those links in the description. All right, so the last step before construction is cutting the center panels from quarter inch plywood. Normally I would use half inch plywood for this, but I'll explain in a minute why I had to do it this way. So building these is really simple. I just add glue to where the tongues will be and I add the top and bottom pieces. Then I just slide the center panel into the grooves and add more glue to the other side. I then add the fourth side and make sure everything is lined up properly before adding clamps. One reason that I love this method of construction is that it's so simple to do. There are no fasteners needed, it's just wood and glue. The other reason I like this method is that if you cut the joints right, it's pretty much guaranteed to be square when you clamp it up. And that's it. I just repeat that entire process nine times and let the glue dry overnight. Okay, so normally when I make frame and panel drawer fronts like this, I am using half inch ply for the center. Like this piece of half inch ply here, I would cut a rabbit around all four sides to create this tongue. So when I assembled this, this tongue would go inside of the grooves in the frame and it would line up nice and flush with the back of the drawer front so that when I attached it, it would be nice and flush. But I don't have nearly enough half inch ply on hand to complete this project, 
but I do have plenty of quarter inch ply. So what I did instead, and what I'm gonna show you here, is I just went ahead and cut a quarter inch piece to go inside of the frame. And then the little void on the back, I made this so that it would fit exactly another piece of quarter inch plywood that I'm gonna go ahead and glue in with some super glue. And that's gonna create that nice flush surface that I can then use to go ahead and mount this to the drawer. Okay, with the front out of the way, I can begin working on the top of the vanity. I'm gonna be making this vanity top out of concrete, specifically white concrete from Concrete Countertop Solutions. This stuff is specially designed to be used in making countertops. And to make the molds for the vanity top, I'm gonna to go ahead and use melamine. I'm using melamine because it's cheap, waterproof, and it gives the concrete a super smooth surface. The sides of the mold are gonna get screwed into the bottom versus the other way around, which would make it a lot harder to demold. You can also see here that I'm pre-drilling these holes. You don't want to screw directly into melamine without pre-drilling because it is super easy to split. You can cause humps in the melamine and all those little imperfections are going to show right through into your concrete top. And once I get everything screwed together, I go ahead and check all my seams to make sure they're tight and there are no defects. Now I have to lay out for the two holes that I need to have to accommodate the faucet and sink drain. I mark a line in the center of the mold and add two circles to mark the spots. I'm using PVC pipe fittings to create these holes in the mold because PVC won't stick to concrete, which should make these easy to remove once the concrete is cured. And to get these to stay in place, I'm going to go ahead and attach them with a little bit of super glue. And that's not a super strong bond, it's just enough to keep them in place for now. Next, I go ahead and caulk the seams of the mold with black silicone caulk. Here's the stuff I'm using. I'll go ahead and leave a link to it below if you want to check it out for yourself. If you're wondering why black, the black is just to make it really visible against the white melamine. It really just helps me see that everything is sealed well. And here's a pro tip. A cake fondant ball tool makes a really nice bead in all the seams. And don't worry about making a mess here. This silicone comes off the melamine really easily and makes for easy cleanup. I'm making sure to get around all the seams inside the mold where water could escape, and that includes the PVC in the center. Like I said, silicone cleans up really easily, and the fondant ball does a great job of separating the waste silicone from the bead, and I was able to go ahead and use a chisel to slide underneath the silicone and peel it right up, no problem. Oh, and also, a Scotch-Brite pad is like a magic eraser on the silicone. It cleans off any remaining residue that you don't want. Now, after a quick vacuum, I'm left with a nice, clean bead all the way around my mold, and it's ready to go. Now, once I got my mold into the place where I'll be doing the concrete pour, I need to go ahead and make sure everything is level. Doing this is gonna ensure that the concrete flows evenly and sets up evenly across the entire mold and I don't create a slanted top. If you find your mold is out of level, any adjustment can be made using shims and just make sure to check along the length to make sure that you're level at all points. All right, with my setup ready to go, it's finally time to make the donuts. The first thing I do is add this suspicious looking baggie of white powder to the bucket. This is just the bright white pigment that came with the white concrete to give it that extra pop of clean, bright white. I then add all my water and give it a whirl just to get everything wet. I then begin adding concrete to the mix about one third of a bag at a time, making sure to mix it thoroughly before adding the next third. If you try to mix the entire bag of concrete all at once, not only will it be immensely hard to mix, but you're also going to risk leaving clumps of dry concrete in the mix, which will weaken the final product. You can see here that when I get everything incorporated, it's a smooth batter-like consistency. All right, everybody into the pool. See how easily that flowed out? I go ahead and gently work everything into the corners of the mold. Also, I'm gonna go ahead at this point and add some fiber mesh reinforcement. This vanity is gonna be over 50 inches long and only one and a quarter inches thick, 
so the extra help from the fiber mesh will hopefully keep everything from breaking as I install it and use it over time. Then I added a second bag of concrete over the mesh. Now when I calculated out how much concrete I would need for this project, it worked out to almost exactly two 50 pound bags and man, that was dead on. I scraped every last bit from this bucket that I could and it was just enough that I could screed it a little bit to make it nice and even with the top of the mold. I then vibrated the heck out of it to get the air bubbles up and to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and use my Theragun. This is one of those tools that's really good at what it was designed for, but even better at something that it was never intended to do. I used this on my concrete side table project and it worked perfectly, not an air bubble in the entire top. I walked around vibrating all the edges for about 20 minutes and I'd let this thing sit to cure for about 48 hours. Now while the concrete is curing, it's back to work on the fronts. After sanding everything to 180 grit, I added cup hooks to the bottom side of each front. These will help me spray the fronts much easier and the holes left by the hooks are gonna be on the bottom edge and never be seen. And you can see here how they fit on a clothes hanger. The first thing I'm gonna to do to these is apply a coat of shellac primer. Using a shellac primer seals the wood well and it prevents the wood grain from raising like it does when exposed to water. I give everything a good coat of primer using my spray rack and then hang them to dry on a second rack. I'm gonna be doing a whole video on my spray booth setup just to show you exactly how my process for getting a killer finish on any project right in my garage works, so stay tuned for that. After everything dries, I go ahead and give each front a quick sanding with 320 grit sandpaper just to knock down any rough feeling spots. And then I vacuum up all the dust so that that doesn't contaminate the final finish. Then it's back to the booth to spray the top coat. On this project, I'm using Sherwin-Williams Emerald Urethane for the finish. This is a water-based finish that is great for use on cabinets and the color, if you're curious, is called Gray's Harbor. I did a total of three coats on these since dark colored paints don't hide very well and it takes more coats to get good coverage. And while I wait for those to fully cure, it's back to the concrete top. It's been 48 hours now and it's time to demold. I think I technically could have done this after 24 hours, but I got busy with other things and just waited the extra day. But for sure you need to demold no later than this because you've got to let the air circulate around all sides of this to allow the concrete to finish curing. And you can see here that the sides of the mold just pop off real easy and reveal the edge. They did look pretty good, but I spotted a few air bubbles in it. I believe this was due probably to the fact that I poured the mold in two batches and maybe someone needed to be vibrating the edges of the first batch while the other person mixed the second bag of concrete and I think that would have resulted in no air bubbles at all. Ah well, no worries. I still love the look of this concrete top. Now before I reveal the top side, I've got to pull out these pieces of PVC. As expected, the first one twisted right out without any trouble. But the bigger one would not budge no matter how much I tried. It just wasn't coming loose with pliers or chiseling away at the concrete. Just nothing was working. Finally, I got the idea to get an oscillating saw and cut a small section out of the PVC and that immediately freed the PVC from the mold. After a quick vacuum, I could go ahead and flip this thing over and pull the mold off to reveal the top. This thing is sweet. No bubbles anywhere on the top surface and a glossy smooth finish due to that melamine. You can see that there are still some spots where the concrete needs to fully cure, which is where I'm gonna go ahead and leave this for now. And while that's hanging out, I'm gonna go ahead and go back and add the hardware to the fronts. For the doors, I'm using Euro style hidden hinges and I begin by drilling the holes for the hinge cups. And the jig I'm using for this makes it really easy. It comes with a 35 millimeter drill bit and a drill guide to make perfect pockets in the doors. For the drawer fronts, I'm using another jig and this one has three adjustment points that allow me to place my drawer poles perfectly. 
This jig is from True Position and it makes this job so easy and repeatable. I'm gonna go ahead and leave a link down in the description to both of these jigs if you wanna check them out for yourself. I love using both of them. All right, time for final details on the top. The first thing I do is I sand the bottom edges to create just a small chamfer and clean up any of the sharp or crumbly areas on that bottom edge of the concrete. This is surprisingly easy to do with just regular sandpaper. Don't get me wrong, you can't hog off tons of material with just sandpaper, but it's perfect for knocking down those rough edges. Now on the top edge, I go ahead and take a lighter approach and use 320 grit sandpaper with water as a lubricant, and I did it by hand. I'm just trying to clean up any small lines or imperfections left by the silicone in the surface. Now, one problem I knew ahead of time is that I'd have to deal with the vessel sink that was gonna be installed on the top of this vanity and the fact that it has a slight convex surface on the bottom and it just doesn't sit flat on the vanity top. Now, I could have tried to build this into my mold to accommodate for that curve, but instead I'm just gonna use a diamond cup wheel on my grinder and create this relief around the drain hole about six inches in diameter. The diamond wheel did a great job and in a matter of minutes, I had this thing dished out and I sprayed it all down with water to clean up all the dust and paste by the grinding. And would you look at that, the sink sits flat now. And the final step here is to seal the concrete. I'm using a special two part sealer also from Concrete Countertop Solutions and I applied three coats since this is a bathroom vanity. I waited about eight hours between each coat. Now, one thing that I wanted to do here before I did the install was go ahead and add some shiplap to the wall behind the vanity. And the first thing I did was locate the studs in the wall. This job is really easy if you have a magnet. Check it out. I just run the magnet along the wall until it stops and sticks to the wall. That's when you've located a drywall screw, which means that the stud is right there. You can mark along each stud by locating more screws. Then you can just measure over 16 inches and search that area for the next stud. I'm always amazed at how well this method works. This is a cheap and simple way to locate the studs if you don't have a stud finder. One other thing I went ahead and did was I fixed the damaged drywall by spackling, sanding, and then painting over the affected areas. I then added my first run of shiplap, making sure that it was nice and level because this board is gonna be what everything else above it references off of for the rest of the wall. And all I'm doing here is nailing these in place with an 18 gauge brad nailer. These are not long pieces. This is not a big section of wall that I'm doing and I don't wanna do anything like add construction adhesive to the back because if I ever wanna take this shiplap off, I just wanna be able to pry it off the wall and not do too much damage to the underlying drywall. And you can see here where each new board sits over the tongue in the previous board to give you that nice little shiplap look. I went ahead and repeated this process until I got to the light. After I disconnected the light, I went ahead and cut a notch and a scrap piece of shiplap and this was gonna help me build my template for going around this box and I also go ahead and measure how far from the wall I need to be in order to make this notch work for the outlet. I just went ahead and cut this notch out with my jigsaw and it installed perfectly. I could then go ahead and add the light back and finish the rest of the wall. All right, now I can finally add the concrete top and before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and run a bead of silicone along the edge of the cabinet top and this is gonna help hold the concrete top in place. And again, with my wife's help, we go ahead and move this thing into place and oh, by the way, re-damage the wall that I just fixed. I could then add a bead of silicone to the sink and go ahead and install it over the drain hole, making sure it was parallel with the front edge before letting it sit and cure overnight. I then went ahead and added the faucet, adjusting it into place and tightening it down. Okay, next come the fronts. I added guides to the bottom edge and side of the cabinets and these are gonna be used to reference the positioning of each of the fronts. To make those guides stick to the cabinet, I'm using double-sided tape. Now the way that I like to install drawer fronts is I go ahead and drive two screws into the holes meant for the drawer pull and this is gonna hold the front in place while I open the cabinet and put the permanent screws in from the backside. 
I can then pull those two screws out of the front and go ahead and drill all the way through the drawers. Then I can just add my screws and put the drawer pulls in place. This makes installing drawer fronts super fast, especially when you use the guides to hold it in place. Now to install the next drawer up, I go ahead and add a 1 8 inch spacer on top of the previous drawer and then add the next front. And I just repeated that process over and over all the way up the cabinet on both sides. Now for the false front in the middle, I go ahead and add a pair of 3 quarter inch plywood cleats and these are going to help me screw it into place using some quarter inch plywood that was already in the cabinet from the previous false front. By the way, my awesome wife helped me yet again by painting the face frame of the cabinet while I was busy working on the fronts and the top. Teamwork makes the dream work. I then just needed to pop on the doors like so. Now with all the new stuff in place, the last thing I need to do is reconnect the water lines to the new faucet and go ahead and connect the drain back up to the P-trap. Now because I installed a vessel sink instead of a built-in sink, I needed to add this extension piece that I got from the home center for just a couple of bucks. This is because the vessel sink is now sitting higher than the old built-in sink was, and so the distance to the P-trap is bigger than it was before. With that, this vanity makeover is complete. I absolutely love the clean, modern look of this vanity, and I also love it even more that I could utilize the old cabinet and give it a whole new life. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this remodel and if you have a vanity in your house that could use a makeover like mine did. I hope that you found this video useful and inspiring, and if so, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time I release a new video. Speaking of videos, here are a couple others that I think you guys will really want to check out. And until next time, have fun in the shop.